Hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webcast. My name is Andrew Barber, and I will be acting as the moderator for today's presentation, which is sponsored by Google for Education. It's titled, The Little District That Did, Fairfield County Schools Shares Their One-to-One -one Story. Before I introduce our two speakers, I want to take a few moments to highlight just a couple of things. First, today's event will be recorded so don't worry about having to scribble down notes or anything like that. And in a couple of days, you'll receive an email from us containing a link to the recorded event. And you'll also be able to download a PDF of the presentation. Second, please ask questions. You don't, and don't feel as if you have to wait until the end. Uh, at any time during the presentation, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your console and hit the send button. I hope we'll have 20, maybe 25 minutes at the end for our speakers to answer your questions. But please don't use the chat box to ask, quest, to ask questions of the presenters. They probably won't have time to monitor the chat. Instead, use chat to talk among yourselves or to contact me or the eSchool News team with any technical issues or, or other concerns you may have. With that, side, with that out of the way, let's turn to our, today's speakers. Brent Sava is Google's Education Program Manager for small to mid-sized districts in the Southeast. He works as a partner with districts looking to use Google's collaborative resources to impact the way students and teachers communicate and learn in today's world. He started his career as a Title I elementary teacher in the Atlanta area before moving to New York to work as a digital resource consultant for Pearson Education. Our second speaker, Dr. Claudia Edwards, is Deputy Superintendent of Academics for the Fairfield County School District in South Carolina. Not only is she determined that every student in her district become a responsible digital citizen, she is also passionate about equipping educators with the digital tools they need to become catalysts for transformative change. Prior to joining Fairfield County Schools, she served in a number of positions in school districts throughout South Carolina, elementary teacher, curriculum specialist, assistant principal, and director of special projects. Now that you know something about who's behind the voices, let's get started. Brent will lead us off. Welcome, Brent. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much. And I apologize, I wasn't the, the best student. I was. Uh texting <laughs> while you were introducing and actually sent a message to all participants. <laughs> um, so I apologize for that, but uh, thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here today. Um, it's certainly exciting um, as a member of the Google for Education team to uh, continue to learn about uh, districts um, that are choosing to go Google. Um, and we'll talk about what that means more in just a moment, but more uh, excited to um, also introduce um, Claudia later on in our presentation, who will tell you about Fairfield County Schools in South Carolina um, and just the awesome work that uh, we've done with them and, and how they've enabled themselves to shine. So without further ado, uh, I, I do, I just want to kind of walk through uh, what it means to go Google and what our team really focuses on. Um, as we, you know, uh, present ourselves in the education space. So our team really focuses a lot on um, this number. And 60% is actually uh, the number of jobs that don't exist yet, uh, that students uh, currently in uh, the K through 12 system are going to have. And it's funny to think about the fact that Google didn't even exist 15 years ago uh, and how fast times change. So we really, um, for us, it's not uh, about uh, specific devices, it's really about collaborative tools and technology um, that will enable students to best prepare uh, for the future. It's exciting to also talk about kind of beyond our uh, platform of options that we offer at Google for Education, um, some of the other, I guess, ventures you could say uh, that we've uh, embarked upon in order to really kind of change what the classroom looks like. To talk about uh, just a few of those, you can see in the top left here is a father uh, who's actually uh, in the military for our country uh, and has been deployed and is able to work on an assignment with his daughter um, who is actually on base in Texas while he's abroad, um, you know, as if he were standing there with her uh, at the kitchen table working on a document. Um, he's able to do that from around the world. 
In the top right, uh, we have a politician um, who's able to sync in through Google Hangouts. Um, when I was in the classroom, one of the things that I guess I came to quickly understand about education is that so much of our life and, and learning is about um, being exposed um, to things beyond the classroom. So with Google Hangouts, um, it, it's great to be able to bring in uh, folks from uh, all different professions and from around um, different parts of, of, of uh, different fields and around the uh, world to come into the classroom and get to speak with students. We actually had President Obama at one point uh, provide a Google Hangout. Uh, so that's really, really awesome to be able to bring in um, resources that you might not uh, be able to otherwise. In the bottom left, um, it's Google um, Art Project where we've actually, uh, this is a picture um, the towers in the Chicago Institute of Art, um, and we have taken such a high resolution picture of it, you can actually zoom in um, and see the brush strokes. Um, so again, to be able to go on a tour that you might not uh, be able to otherwise go on. And then uh, with Google Tracks in the bottom right, we can see uh, a virtual field trip to the Galapagos Islands. Um, so again, just really awesome ways to be able to engage and interact with students in a way that um, didn't formally exist. So for, for us and for our team and Google at large, it's really about having open technology to improve learning for everyone um, and, and, and everywhere. And so, again, it's about learning when you want, where you want, and how you want. Um, it's not about, again, about devices. It's about learning learning on the move and learning in ways that are, are comfortable for um, ourselves and, and the technology that we use. So when we talk about our Google for Education team, um, there's really, I guess, four uh, buckets you could say that we focus on. Um, it's about empowerment, it's about choice, it's about teamwork, uh, and one of the buzzwords that you'll hear very often with Google is um, about scalability. We want to be able to impact um, the way that we do things at, at scale. So the first um, portion of that is really about empowerment, um, and we want to empower teachers, but we also want to empower students. Um, we want for um, educators to be able to go out and find the content that is appropriate for what it is they're teaching. We also want to give students the ability to go out and to uh, explore uh, learning in ways that, that is comfortable to them and to be able to find uh, applications and, and books and resources that are uh, beneficial to, to what it is they're trying to achieve in research. From there, to, uh, from here we talk about choice, um, and I'm sure Claudia will, will talk about this a little bit later on as well, but um, again, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's not about um, the specific laptop or the tablet or uh, the mobile device that you use. Um, with our platform, it, it works across an, uh, any system, and it looks the same and it's seamless across the system. We like to talk about how Google has a 99.5% uptime, um, so if your device is powered on and ready to go, so are we. Um, and it's just great because a student might be, you know, working in a small group in a classroom uh, on an assignment um, on, on let's say Google Chromebooks uh, during the day or might be MacBooks um, and they're engaging and collaborating through Google Docs. Um, I might be able to pick up uh, where I left off on the bus on the way home on my smartphone or uh, on the soccer field or after football practice. Um, and then when I get home, I might my parents might have a, a PC or a desktop. And again, the, our system, our platform um, is seamless across the board. So it's, it's not about having a specific device. It's about the ability to um, learn anytime, anywhere and, and choose the device. Um, we talk about teamwork, and um, if you've never used a collaborative doc before, um, this, is, this is what it looks like. You can see we have two folks here who are um, you know, sharing information uh, for teachers. A lot of times this is uh, working on lesson plans collaboratively. Obviously, students can work on assignments. Um, I had a district the other day I was talking to how they um, were working with their board, uh, their board members to actually um, work on a new uh, presentation, I guess, for, for the district and to be presented to uh, split up for passing, and they all were working on it through a collaborative doc. So it's really awesome to see how um, teamwork uh, is changed through the ability to collaborate um, through, our, through our, our platform. And last but not least, and the, the one word that I said you'll, you'll hear a lot is about scalability. Um, the great thing with going Google is the fact that you can manage uh, four or 40,000 devices. Um, 
all from all from the web, all from one computer. So for IT directors, um, this kind of really changes the, the landscape in terms of being able to uh, update uh, network settings. Uh, we push out security updates every six weeks, so uh, we really kind of alleviate the need for um, summer updates or, or refreshes uh, for, for um, software and things of that nature because it's all done through the cloud. Uh, on the classroom level, it's really awesome because teachers now have the ability to differentiate learning on the spot, uh, whether that be with Chrome apps um, or when we talk about the tablet world, um, you can actually push out an app and within 30 seconds it begins downloading uh, on the devices of the students. So we really changed the, uh, the landscape in terms of um, how devices are deployed, uh, but also how content is deployed and how quickly it's done. When we talk about uh, Google Apps for Education, that's um, really our core services uh, as a Google for Education team. That includes Drive, Calendar, Gmail. Um, some of you might be familiar with recently released Google Classroom, uh, which has uh, kind of revolutionized how um, teachers and students interact uh, with Google Docs and, and um, in the classroom. And then last but not least, slides. So I want to take a moment really quickly to kind of show you um, our Learning Has Gone Google video, which kind of nicely highlights what the products look like live. So again, that um, kind of nicely allows you to see just what it looks like to collaborate, and you can see some folks were working on um, Hangouts and being able to connect virtually. We have a superintendent, I believe, that's in uh, Indiana who actually delivers his beginning of the year um, speeches through Google Hangouts, and he's able to be at 10 different schools at the same time. Um, from here, we like to talk about the fact that um, uh, over 80 of the top 100 universities in the country right now have gone Google. Um, and uh, from there, we talk about the fact uh, that we have 30 million, um, almost 40 million at this point, actually, um, students and teachers across the world who have uh, adopted Google Apps for education. Um, again, we're not just US-based. We uh, have students in more than 180 countries that use Google Apps. And the best part about going Google uh, in terms of our platform with uh, mail, as I mentioned, calendar, docs, uh, drives, things of that nature. It's all entirely free. Um, so it's, it's really awesome to know that uh, Google is uh, of the belief that education should be free and attainable, um, and that's why we've come into the education space and are uh, offering our um, Google Apps for Education entirely free of charge to districts. To jump back uh, quickly, you know, we've kind of talked about what it looks like in terms of having our platform and our resources. Uh, we found that uh, as districts went uh, Google uh, with Google Apps for Education, uh, there was also a need for affordable devices to be able to bring down these cloud-based resources uh, at an affordable price. Um, and so you might be familiar with Google Chromebooks, um, and you can see on the right here of the screen, we also have our Android tablets. And we really found that with our portable devices, we're taking the country by storm, and although uh, we're relatively new in the education space, uh, we're having a really large splash, and we're well poised to be the number one device uh, in the education space here, uh, hopefully in the near future. So Chromebooks really allow us to get uh, to lessons faster, uh, the same experience everywhere, information is easy to share. Uh, in the fact that everything is cloud-based, and we always like to highlight uh, the fact that they're safe and secure. Uh, Google Chromebooks boot up in about eight seconds, um, and it's great because 
any student can use any Chromebook and all of their information is the same on any of those devices uh, because it's, again, it's cloud-based. Long gone for us are the days of saving files locally and having to email back and forth. And uh, it's great when everything is stored in real time and is updated and saved in real time. Um, and then when it comes to safety and security, uh, we have our, our wonderful, um, if you go to our google.com forward slash edu forward slash trust, uh, you can find all of our um, compliance information. Uh, again, it's not about one specific device for us. You can see here we have a number of manufacturers uh, who have um, created Chromebooks, uh, especially uh, for the education space, as we've seen the need. Uh, we have a variety of different sizes, shapes, uh, resolutions, durability. Um, it's just again, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, we realize this, different districts have different needs. And so um, as you potentially have interest in adopting devices, we can talk more specifically uh, about what those types of uh, devices are and how they might uh, benefit and fit into your district. Um, and as mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of the scalability, um, the Google Admin Console is really what allows um, for Chromebooks, for example, to be scaled at large. Um, the admin of a district can um, simply log into the admin panel, update users, organizational units, can push out different um, apps and settings, uh, different allowances. For example, some school districts don't want K through two students or K through two three students to have access to email, um, and so that can be turned on and off, uh, different features like that, uh, depending upon what it is uh, that you're trying to achieve. Um, you can also disable guest access, and uh, the really nice thing is with kiosk mode, um, when it comes to standardized testing like PARC or Smarter Balance or whatever your state or district might use, um, the, the IT director can go in, disable, or excuse me, put the devices into kiosk mode in the morning during testing when, when testing normally takes place, uh, and then at the drop of a hat, the director can disable um, kiosk mode and the, and the device can, can go right back into normal use uh, for afternoon uh, sessions. So that's just kind of a, gets, gets much more in depth, and I'm sure Claudia could admit to this as well, gets much more in depth. Uh, than that, but that's just kind of the overview of what it means, uh, the more tech side of, of scalability. Um, we also like to, to mention uh, in Malaysia as one of our really big examples of, of scalability. Um, the entire country uh, enabled, uh, now every student in the country of uh, Malaysia is enabled uh, with a Chromebook uh, with 4G connectivity. Um, Audi and Fairfield, they've also chosen to go down the route of giving students uh, connectivity anytime, anywhere with, with um, wireless connectivity. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's a great example of um, a country who's, or a district, I guess you could say, a system that has chosen to go, on, to go Google and has seen great success uh, with the ability to collaborate anytime, anywhere. To kind of uh, move over to tablets for just a moment before I pass it over to Claudia, um, we want to mention Android tablets and Google Play for Education. Um, they're really designed to make learning uh, very easy in the classroom, and we like to talk about the three Ds uh, when it comes to tablets and, and Google uh, Android tablets and, and Play for Education. That's the deployment uh, of, of the, the actual devices, uh, the discovery of content for educators, and the ease of actually delivering that content to students. Um, so again, with the deployment, the directors can easily deploy the apps with the bumping the tablet, the deploy network settings. Uh, all of our tablets are enabled with an NFC chip, near field communication chip, which allows, uh, you don't actually have to touch each device to deploy them uh, or for user settings. Uh, once the de devices are easily deployed, uh, we've got to actually take a step back. We have a really cute video of some students in Chicago who were able to deploy 30 tablets within three minutes, uh, I believe it was. Um, for a classroom, so uh, by simply bumping the tablet. So deployment has really changed for us, uh, the way uh, has, for us has changed how, how um, tablets are deployed. When we kind of go down to the um, classroom level, again, teachers can go into our Google Play for Education store. Um, you might be familiar with um, some, other, some of our competitors' uh, app, application stores, but we have our own store. Um, so for the consumer-facing stores, Google Play for Education, um, and then we have Google, I'm sorry, Google Play, and then for the education world, we have a, a pared down store, which I'll mention again here in a moment, um, that's specifically for education and is vetted for education. So teachers can easily go in and discover content that's appropriate for their classroom. 
Um, and then again, the ability to deliver that content within you know, 30 seconds to a minute uh, on each student's unique device. Um, I always like to point out because uh, it's important for districts to know that you can't just walk out to a retailer um, and be able to uh, purchase an Android tablet and manage it uh, in the education space. We actually have four devices that are approved for Google uh, for Education. You can see those devices here. Uh, again, we like to give uh, options uh, in the educational world. You can see our different devices here, different sizes, different price ranges. Uh, one of them actually can come with a built-in keyboard. So again, it's not about a specific device for us, but these are the four devices currently that are approved for the education space. Um, we have um, some other manufacturers who have approached us about de developing uh, additional tablets. Another great thing uh, about our tablets is that you can have more than one user on each tablet. Uh, you can see here, uh, you, I, we actually allow for you to have up to five students on a tablet. It's a unique experience for each student, uh, even though it is the same device. Um, which has really kind of uh, revolutionized being able to take the cost of the tablet and stretch it uh, to more than just one student. Within uh, Google Play for Education, uh, we have Android apps, we have Chrome apps, we have K through 12 books, and then we also pair down YouTube uh, in the education space to uh, vet videos that are appropriate for uh, the K through 12 environment. Um, so again, that's the type of content you're going to find in the Google Play for Education store. And I mentioned just a moment ago that it is vetted by a third-party company. Um, of, of current and former educators who go in and, and tag, which I'll mention uh, here in just a moment. You can see um, these are educator approved apps, as I mentioned, a company called Q. Um, and you can see where they have the different, um, they go in and tag our apps based upon whether they're education appropriate. They tag them by content area. Uh, we even go as far as tag them for uh, specific common core skills so that uh, teachers don't have to spend endless amounts of time going in and searching for applications that are appropriate for um, their, their, their needs and their students' needs. Um, also, like to mention, too, that we allow for um, educators for, for school systems to rent our books. Um, Long gone are the days of, <laughs> I, I, I for, for one had to read Ethan Frum, and no offense to anyone out there who uh, teaches Ethan Frum at this point, but um, my, my sibling also had to read <laughs> Ethan Frum, and so we'd like to point out that you can stay more up to date with current content, um, and you don't have to purchase the book that sits on the shelf for 10 years and, and, and is read multiple times. Um, some teachers really like to go out and pull in newer content, whether it be The Hunger Games or other other um, novels that students are into, and, and you don't have to invest in a hard copy book. You can rent them uh, for a number of months or half a year uh, to enable more affordable um, content to come into the classroom. And I wanted to mention one other thing really quickly, too, before I move on to Google Classroom and pass it over um, to Claudia. We actually um, allow for school districts to purchase um, our apps via PO. Um, so, again, a credit card is not required uh, to purchase apps uh, through our um, app store for devices. It can be done through a system-wide um, PO, uh, which has really enabled districts to more easily uh, not only purchase uh, apps, but be able to assign certain amounts of uh, money to be spent on apps uh, for certain classrooms or departments. Um, so again, that's, that's a nice differentiator for us. Um, and I'll mention uh, Google Classroom uh, is was released in uh, just uh, two months ago, really, at this point, which has changed the way that teachers and students interact uh, with Google Docs and Drive and Gmail. There's lots of notifications now where teachers can uh, set due dates and um, lock in uh, specific content. And so what I want to do now is um, jump back and actually show you what the product looks like live, and then we'll pass it over to Claudia.
and it's <laughs> slightly outdated video, it, it isn't coming soon as it's fully released. So for um, those districts out there that already have Google Apps for Education and, and haven't been using Classroom, please know that it's fully available. Um, so with that being said, I want to go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Uh, Edwards. Uh, she's the Deputy Superintendent of Academics, as Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, and excited for her to be able to tell you more about Fairfield County Schools in South Carolina and their one-to-one -one story. Thank you, Brent. Um, today I'm going to share with you a very quick video that I believe is truly a mouthful. This video will share with you our, give you a glimpse, a glimpse into our journey to become one-to-one -one with Google. Now, just to give you a glimpse of our district, we have approximately over 2,900 students in grades, child development through 12th grade. 85% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. And currently, we have 1,140 Chromebooks deployed to students in grades, uh, first grade through 12th grade. Our small district is composed of five elementary schools, one middle, one high school, one career technology center, and one alternative ed center. We have a very, very small committed to technology and curriculum staff that you will hear more about that really makes this one-to-one -one story happen. Now, our journey began in 2012, and you notice here on this picture, this picture represents myself and my team, and we literally jumped off the cliff back in 2012 with the idea or the concept to move forward with the Google Chromebook. Now, as I said earlier in the video, I came back from an opportunity in, in Florida to attend a conference. This was my first opportunity to really see a Google Chromebook in action. And I rallied my troops, I rallied my team together and said, I found something that I really think could truly impact what we wanted to do with our students to impact student learning. Now, our one-to-one -one goal, we had three goals, but of course, the student being first. The first goal was that we truly wanted to impact student engagement. We found that some of our classrooms still were teacher-centered, and we wanted our classrooms to be more student-engaged. Additionally, we wanted to make sure that we had equitable access to the computers for all of our students. And we felt that the Google Chromebook, along with the, the suite of tools that Google offers, was something that we could easily sustain over time. Now, as Brent said earlier, the Google Chromebook has an eight-second boot time, is easily managed, 
And best of all, the Google Apps for Education suite of tools was free. It even, allow, it even allows for student collaboration. It was cloud-based, so that meant that my technology department didn't have to worry about managing um, this particular hardware. And best of all, it was powered by the Chrome web browser. Now, in the beginning, our journey, we started with 15 classrooms in grades 1 through 12, and we equipped each of these classrooms with a mobile lab cart. We started with a, commit, uh, a committed group of individuals who met monthly in collaborative meetings. And myself, along with principals, served as support, and we conducted monitoring visits to ensure that the deployment of the Google Chromebooks were successful. Now, in the beginning, we had a group of some com committed individuals and professionals. And, and we turned these individuals, they were called Google Chromies. Now, up front, the Google Chromies had to commit 30 hours of professional development on Saturday. They were composed of, of teachers, district leaders, and media specialists, and they were nominated by our principals to serve as Google Chromies. And I was looking, when we started this journey, I was looking for teachers who were great teachers first, and who also were very technology proficient. And these individuals became known as our Google Chromies. And as you can see from this picture, um, we purchased T-shirts to get the excitement about going Google. And we really, really wanted to have a, a shared buy-in and commitment by all of these individuals first in hopes that this will become contagious and individuals throughout the district will become excited about this new opportunity. Now, when we began this process of deploying, uh, we centered around some core apps that we first wanted to make sure that our classroom teachers were comfortable in using. We um, use, utilized Google Animate, which is a video creation tool, Remind, which is a um, text notification system, We Video, which is a video production app, Quizlet, a Flash Maker, Classroom Dojo is a tool that you can use for classroom management. And of course, we utilize YouTube where teachers could curate videos that were directly related to their content. But you notice in the center of this graphic that Google Drive was the center for everything that we did. The Google Drive has numerous tools that I'm quite sure all of you are aware of, Google Forms, Google Presentation, Google Docs, um, Google Sheets. All of those tools were a huge part of our rollout to make sure that our teachers were comfortable with these digital tools before we did a full deployment. We made sure that the teachers got the computers um, at least three months prior to the initial deployment because we wanted to make sure that they were comfortable with the tools themselves personally and then in turn were comfortable integrating these tools into their classroom. Now, we did our deployment in May of 2012, which many of you may be thinking that, well, this is the end of the school year. But what we did was we did this after standardized testing. The students tested in the morning, and in the afternoon, we actually tested our students um, or tested the deployment of these computers with our students. If you notice here in the pictures in the left and the right, you have a, one of my district staff persons on the left, the teacher on the right. And that was intentional. When we deployed our Google Chromebooks, we paired the, new, the teacher with the district staff person to make sure that they had support in the classroom throughout this particular rollout. Because we wanted to make sure that the teacher's um, anxiety was lessened, and we wanted to make sure that if any problems occurred, a member of my staff or myself was available to help troubleshoot that problem for our teachers. Now, we recently, under our, uh, our new superintendent, uh, we embarked on, on a new initiative called the Stem Early College Academy. In this particular program, students are able to earn a high school diploma and a uh, associate's degree in science um, by the time they graduate from high school. So we wanted to add a technology component to this. And as Brent said earlier, we wanted to make sure that we provided 3G access to all of our students. So those students who were participants in this program, it's a, a similar to a magnet program, 
received a Google Chromebook, but they also received a MiFi. Because of our large demographic area, um, we want to make sure that the digital access was not going to be an obstacle or a challenge for many of our families. Because as I stated earlier, our families um, are composed of about 85% of them are on free or reduced lunch. So we wanted to make sure that the, the technology became an equalizer for our students. So our students get a Chromebook and they also receive a MIFI so that they can really have the opportunity to learn 24-7. And we started this program back in the spring of 2013, and we have about 85 students who currently are a part of the STEM Early College Academy. Now, some lessons learned. And I will tell you that these are some lessons learned the hard way. And I felt it was important that we kind of share with you, those of you who are contemplating moving forward um, with the deployment or moving forward with um, Google Apps for Education, these are just some things that we have learned um, on our path to becoming one-to-one. -one. Do your homework months in advance. Make sure that you get buy-in from all of the stakeholders. We, before we initiated this process, I had to go to my school board and get buy-in from them. And then in turn, that buy-in, was I had to get it from the administrators, teachers, parents, and even our students. As I said, stated earlier, train, 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 train your teachers up front first. This for us was critical to ensure that this initiative, this one-to-one -one initiative was a success. And also prepare your infrastructure. We had to purchase additional access points. We had to increase our bandwidth. And those are the kinds of things that you want to do before the devices arrive in your building. Have plenty of support available for the classroom teachers, especially the first couple of times that the students will be using the Chromebook. Some of my most veteran teachers who were savvy classroom teachers were extremely nervous about having 25 students with 25 devices and only one of them. So in turn, we made sure, as I showed you earlier, that we had another person in the classroom just as a support. And if possible, go outside and get additional support as needed. Google has some collaborative partners that I'm quite sure that Brent would love to be able to share with you. And so we did go outside just to get an additional partner to help us initially. And, and that partnership was able to help us deploy our first 150 devices. And then we felt comfortable as time went on with the other devices. Additionally, um, have funds for the behind the scenes expenses. Access point, battery chargers, I will even give you an example. We had a student, one of our STEM Early College Academy students, her cat ate the battery charger. Now, of course, no one anticipates a cat eating a battery charger, but of course, we had some extras that were in our inventory. And of course, the parent did, in fact, have to pay for um, a replacement. But again, those are the kind of behind the scene expenses that you don't anticipate when you're doing a one-to-one -one rollout. Develop a clear deployment plan. Um, at the end, I'm going to share with you our going Google blog that has our deployment plan. And that deployment plan is a clear checklist of some things to do prior to deploying the Chromebooks out to your students and to your teachers. Also, have additional Chromebooks in your inventory to replace broken or impaired Chromebooks. Because once students get used to having these devices 24-7, they don't want to be without them for even a small minute. So have some backup in your inventory to make sure that the students uh, don't receive a gap in instruction because their device is currently being repaired. Also, visit other districts to observe model one-to-one -one implementation plans. These are, we visited Richland 2, which was one of the first districts to go um, totally, um, totally Google with their Chromebooks. So have a, if you get an opportunity, go out and, and observe some model implementation plan, implementation programs. And lastly, develop a PLN. Join Google Plus, Edmodo, or Google Groups that focus on Google Apps and on Google Chromebooks. I would highly encourage, if you are not a user of Google Plus, there are plenty of communities out there where you can pose a question and honestly you get a response back within minutes of individuals who have gone through with the process of moving forward with one-to-one -one with the Google Chromebooks. 
Now, in our journey, um, we've decided that we're going to expand fully one-to-one -one Chromebooks in grades 7 through 12 at this point. We've started something in our district uh, called a, di a district Google endorsement. And that's an endorsement that sets apart teachers in our school district um, where they, they can become Google experts. And as I mentioned earlier, we have Google Chromies, but now we're moving forward with, with a term called Google Gurus. And these are individuals who have passed a certain amount of proficiency tests, who will serve as Google coaches um, to help coach other teachers in the integration of technology. And as I said earlier, um, we have a very, very strong commitment and ongoing professional development for our teachers, our principals, as it relates to the integration of technology. So we're going to continue to provide ongoing professional development to ensure that our classroom teachers and our leaders are prepared to continue to integrate the digital tools that Google Apps provides. Now, as a part of our Q&A on the slide, if you have some additional questions that may not get answered today, feel free to reach out to me via my Twitter handle, which is at drcedwards74. Feel free to email me at cedwards at fcscchromebooks.us. And I've also given you two links. The first link is our Going Google blog, which has tons of resources and a couple of my presentations listed there. Um, that you can utilize. And, it's, and the second link is recently we had the opportunity to host a Google Symposium um, with Google, and that website gives you a list of some additional resources along with some pictures, just so that you can get a clear idea as to where we are in our journey and where we hope to go. Well, this concludes my portion of the presentation, and I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew for additional questions. Well, Claudia, thank you, and Brent, thank you so much for sharing your insights about using Chromebooks and Google tools in an educational setting. We, we have uh, a little more than 15 minutes remaining, which is a good thing because attendees have a lot of questions for both of you. Um, so let's see how many we can, can work through. And, and the first one I would actually like to address to both Brent and Claudia. Uh, you know, during the, during the presentation, uh, Claudia referenced uh, students using MiFi if they didn't have internet access at home. And this is obviously a major problem around the country. So, uh, you know, Brent, why don't we start with you to talk about how, um, it, with a cloud-based solution like this, what are some of the solutions that uh, schools are using for students that do not have internet access? Sure, so um, the great thing is there's offline versions of uh, our platform of solutions. So for example, a student that doesn't have uh, internet, internet access at home, um, for example, the teacher could you know, give the assignment during the day and uh, and just make sure that they have the offline functionality of our platform of devices enabled. Uh, so uh, when they leave, um, you know, a Wi-Fi enabled area that they can still edit a document, obviously the collaboration uh, wouldn't take place, unfortunately, because of the fact that you have to be uh, enabled. But a student could still very easily work on a, a presentation or a Google Sheet or a Google Doc, um, and then as soon as that student is back uh, and, and connected, uh, again, all of that information will up date. So uh, definitely a question that we get often, but we certainly uh, work to make sure that uh, Chromebooks and Google Apps for Education aren't just something that would, well, Chromebooks especially aren't something that would just work a lot when, when you're enabled. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Claudia, could you talk a little bit about the MyFi program and, and how you set that up and negotiated it and, and how that's working? Well, we uh, went with a, uh, a, a cellular provider um, who has um, enough coverage within our geographic area to provide the MIFI coverage for our students. Um, we contracted with that particular cellular provider, and we are actually absorbing the cost of that fee for our students. Um, it's not a cost that is passed on to the families. It's a, a fee that we have elected um, to go ahead and take care of for our families. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at expanding this, and we recognize that there are going to be many families that may not have internet access. So one of the things that we have elected to do or will be doing with this other rollout is that we're going to have some MIFIs available for checkout from the media center. 
So those students who may need to ch take a map out home over the weekend or on a day-to-day -day basis will be allowed to check them out just as, as if they would check out an actual um, textbook. And then the other thing is, is that um, we open up our buildings very early on um, Monday through Friday. Many of our students um, have about an hour or so commute into our schools. And so one thing we're looking at is the possibility of putting Wi-Fi on our school buses so that students can get access to the internet on their way home. And then we're also um, looking at allowing the students, our students can now come into the building early, um, starting at seven o'clock uh, to get connected to the Wi-Fi um, so that they can in turn um, make sure that all of their assignments have been sent, synced and they're ready to begin the school day. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you know, you indicated that uh, the school is absorbing the cost of the MiFi, and let, let's stay on the on the funding issue. Uh, one of the questions from the attendees is, it says that they're from a large district that does not have funds allocated to technology, so the principal is actually required to raise his own funds. Uh, they do use Google for education, and, and the question was, how did your school district acquire enough funding to move the entire district? I think one of the ways we did this, we did this in phases. Um, as I said, we started in 2012, and what we did was we leveraged funding sources um, such as Title I, our federal dollars, um, to, to go ahead and outfit our schools with the Google Chromebooks at the elementary level. And then also we used some state funding um, that I, I set aside specifically to go ahead and purchase uh, Chromebooks in phases. Um, this new rollout deployment that we'll be embarking on within the next couple of weeks, uh, as a part of our superintendent's vision, um, we have uh, set aside money in our capital improvements as well to help sustain this in the long run. So if any any advice I will give is to start small and leverage the, uh, the financial resources of funding that you have at your disposal um, first, whether it's Title I or some other state level or local funding, and then do it in phases, um, and then hopefully by the time you get to a certain level, whether it's the second or third year, you will then by the third year would have gone ahead and been able to go one to one by buying a little bit of Chromebooks at each time. Okay, terrific. Well, you know, for the next question, why don't we turn back to to Brent? Uh, and Brent, one of the one of the attendees uh, was wondering about whether they'd be able to disable the email portion. Of, of, the, of the Google products, uh, will those students still have access to, if they disable email, will they still have access to the other apps such as Drive and Classroom? Yep, that's a, certainly a great question and one that deserves another one, another point of clarity. Um, again, when we talk about the scalability, that's, that's what's awesome. You don't have to touch each device in order. Since, since all of the settings are applied to a user, not a device, um, IT director can go in and absolutely we can turn off uh, email for elementary students but enable it for middle and high or vice versa and you absolutely have access to, um, you know, you want everyone to have access to the classroom but only certain students or certain organizational units or groups of students uh, to have access to uh, mail or drive or docs or you, it's very easy to cater uh, very uh, specific uh, access to different, different users. Okay. You, you, you talked about scalability a, a lot, and um, in one of your slides, you've mentioned that you have 40,000 devices. Uh, is, was that an actually a, an upper limit, or was that just a large number you pulled? I mean, what about 160,000 devices? <laughs> is this, is this uh, the sky's the limit here? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really our goal. I, I don't know if there's ever been a test for if there is an upper limit that obviously you saw with Malaysia and have 100,000 Chromebooks. Um, I, our largest deployment to date in the United States has been about 32,000, I believe, and again, it, it changes uh, all the time, but um, that's, that's the whole point of being cloud-based is that with settings being able to push out uh, through the cloud uh, and, and devices managed through the cloud, there, there really is, you know, it's unlimited, so yeah, 40,000 isn't certainly an upper limit. I think it's just looked good for being able to say uh, in a presentation from four to 40,000. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it did sound good. Uh, all right, uh, Claudia, why don't we, we, we come back to, back to you. Uh, 
Um, and but a question about the actual how the computers are used during instruction. Um, is it possible for the teachers to manage the student computers during instruction? Can they control student computers? You know, to take control of them? Can they can they push web pages, etc.? Uh, how, how does that work? Well, we purchased a, another software program called Hapara, which is an external um, tool to Google. And, but it works in um, it works in um, co in collaboration with the Google tools. So if you were to buy Hapara, you could basically close student screens. You could observe what students are working on. Um, you can monitor their usage. I have even been at home at night and want to see what some of the STEM early college students were doing. And I was able to log into my Hapara account, go to a particular student, and see exactly what they were actually working on in real time. And at the time, I, the student was working on an assignment, and I, sent, I was able to send the, uh, the student a comment saying, good job. On one instance, I noticed that a student was on something that I had a little bit of question about. And so I sent that student an a email or a comment while the window was open, and it freaked them out for a minute because they didn't realize I was you know, looking in the background. <laughs> However, they were able to respond to my question, and it calmed my fears. Okay. So HAPAR is one is one thing that you can definitely utilize to help the management overall um, of the of the um, usage of the Chromebooks in the classroom. And I, and one other thing I'm going to add to that is that one of my Google Chromies, one of my teachers, came up with a brilliant idea. She he he makes sure that at all times that he can see the screens to his students. So he has his students sitting in a U shaped and the student screens are always facing toward the U so that he can always see exactly what the students are doing just by looking across, um, standing at the top of the U and looking across to all of the computers. And now um, I'm going to jump in real quick, if that's OK, and just add a couple, couple comments. Um, with Google for Education, we uh, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but we had, there are a lot of great um, Again, you know, kind of uh, have an emphasis on being an open environment. Uh, there's, I say that to say there's a lot of great third-party content out there, like Hapara or Promevo has um, uh, the company that has similar uh, type of ability to kind of monitor uh, devices. So definitely, there's there's lots of I guess open source uh, resources out there that districts can invest in to enable certain features that might not be native to. Um, our, our admin panel. Uh, the one thing I will say uh, that is a little bit techy, I don't want to get too techy on anybody today, I'm sure we've got some tech folks out there, uh, but with our devices specifically and with Chromebooks, we actually have an awesome feature called forced re-enrollment. Um, obviously theft can be an issue in certain districts, and I don't know if Claudia can, can talk about any issues that she's had, but um, with forced re-enrollment, uh, actually what happens when a when a Chromebook, for example, arrives in a school district, you enroll that device to your specific domain, um, and that device cannot be used by a user that doesn't have access to that domain. Um, and so, you you know, when you sync your devices in the beginning, whether you do it yourself or you work with one of our partners or resellers uh, with the type of white glove service, that uh, device essentially is useless. It's a brick. Uh, unless it, uh, it can be accessed with someone, uh, with someone who has an account for that district. So what we often tell districts is, you know, make that very well known in the beginning, uh, because, you know, we want to make sure that the devices stay safe and stay assigned in, in the area that they are, um, you know, supposed to be in. I guess whether it be in the school district or with the one-to-one -one take home contract that the district has with their students. Okay. Claudia, during your presentation, you, you stressed the importance of getting buy-in from everyone and anyone, uh, and and just judging, you can tell from the questions coming in that this is a big issue for uh, educators across the country. Uh, can you just walk us through how you went about getting the buy-in from parents, and also, you know, from from you know, people within the district itself, uh, faculty and, and administrators, who really were uncomfortable going in this direction. I mean, other than the sheer force of your personality, what kind of strategies would you recommend? Well, I think one of the first strategies that I would recommend is modeling. 
um, it was very important as leaders, and I'm speaking from my position as a leader, is that I am modeling my expectations. I'm a Google Chromebook user, so when I am conducting meetings, I'm going into classrooms, I'm actively going into classrooms and actually supporting teachers and students. I'm working with students as well and actually um, uh, getting um, the students to become more comfortable with the technology, which isn't very difficult. Um, but to go back to your question, going back to the buy-in, I think one of the first things that I had to do was that I had to pick with the support of my principals, the, the, the right people to sit on the right seat on the bus. And those were the individuals who literally will tell me up front, Dr. Edwards, I feel comfortable, uncomfortable doing this. Then I will in turn and say, okay, let's figure this out together. I didn't leave them to figure this out by themselves. So you have to have a, 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 a committed group of core professionals first Get those individuals to be your champion, to, to really start drumming up the excitement, and then in turn, those teachers would then get other teachers involved and excited, and then it becomes a system. It, it becomes like people are getting contagious. It's like it could, it, it, it's just the excitement starts to really develop. And then with the T-shirt, I paid a couple dollars for a t-shirt, gave it to those teachers. Those teachers then in turn became ambassadors because other people who did not have a teacher, a t-shirt wanted to know, well, what do I need to do to get a t-shirt? And then, then the teacher then in turn can give a commercial about, well, these are the things that we're doing with the Google initiative. This is what a Google Chromebook to do. So it's important that you get some champions, people who are going to be your champions out there. Now I will tell you, we had some individuals who were not um, comfortable with um, the fact that this was a computer, a laptop, a netbook. They were uncertain about, well, I don't hear anything running in the inside. How can this be a computer? Is it secure? Is it safe? And so we literally had to do some information sessions with our parents, letting them know that you have access to your child's password, user account at any given time. We showed them how to log into their child's account so that they knew that they could be a part of this learning journey with their child. So you have to do a kind of like a three-prong approach with starting with, first of all, you got to have your board buy-in, followed by your classroom teachers and your parents, because the students are ready for the technology, we have to catch up to them. And that's kind of how I sold it to a lot of my um, stakeholders here. Okay. Well, we probably have time for maybe maybe one more question too, if if we really rush. But uh, uh, you know, with this Chromebook initiative that you, you you put into the schools, you know, there's obviously a lot of legacy instructional resources and other technology that's already in place in the schools that has been there prior to the Chromebook. How do you overcome the obstacles of of these instructional resources and, and that are not compatible with Chromebooks? What 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 have you done with them, and, and what is their face? And I think you're leading to, Andrew, maybe perhaps textbooks. Um, like the textbooks are used mainly as a supplementary resource. And so um, it does not, um, the, 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 the textbook itself is still a viable part of the curriculum, but the teachers have learned to use the technology to enhance what they're currently doing. And I think that's important to realize that the, the technology does not replace good teaching. And I think it's important that anybody who decides to move forward with a one-to-one -one technology initiative, you have to have good, sound instructional practices in place first, and then the technology will enhance what you are already doing really well. And I'll jump in really quickly too and say, we don't mention this uh, in the presentation, but we actually uh, also have another uh, device. If you're, if you're talking specifically about legacy hardware, um, districts that have like labs, for example, we have something called a Chrome box that actually allows you to take an existing monitor and essentially turn it into a, a Chromebook with a Chrome box. So just to kind of <laughs> toss that little snippet out there. Um, but aside from that, I mean, it's just a matter of like device refresh, Andrew, in terms of districts that are looking to uh, replace legacy technology if they choose to go Google. Um, you know, it's just a matter of replacing existing laptops or, or desktops with uh, our devices. So hopefully that kind of answers um, legacy yep. hardware questions. That, that's great. Thank you. 
Uh, and unfortunately, that's all the time that we have left today. And, and I apologize, there are an awful lot of questions that uh, attendees posed that we did not get to. And I apologize for that. I wish we could go on. Uh, but unfortunately, we must stop here. I do want to thank uh, Brent Sava and Dr. Claudia Edwards for their excellent presentations. Uh, it was really fantastic. And I also want to thank Google for Education for its support today. And a final reminder, we will send out an email to all attendees when the recording of the webinar is ready. So thank you again, and this concludes today's webcast. Goodbye. <laughs>